Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the Calamus section and we turn now to a little poem, Recorders, Ages, Hints. Now this is one of those really intriguing uh, little poems that becomes one of the more controversial poems actually um, as, as, uh, as we start to uh, finish, especially um, at the end of this poem. Now, we're going to see this as it relates to not only this poem, but the poem to follow. When you take recorders, ages, hints, and then when I heard at the close of day the two poems in unison, you really are going to begin to see why Calamus section is itself fairly controversial. Now we're continuing our hope and assumptions that you have been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, the Talks with Walt uh, information there. Our hope is that you've been following everything from the inscriptions on all the way up through uh, the poem that we just did, the base of all metaphysics. Now our Norton's information for the background here in regards to hints is that um, first of all both this manuscript and the 1860 text of this poem began with the following two lines which actually dropped in 1867 when he took its present title and form. Quote, you bards of ages hence, exclamation point, when you refer to me, mind not so much my poems, nor speak of me that I prophesied of the states, by the way, the capitalized, states capitalized, and led them the way of their glories. Now that's an interesting set of lines that will be edited, and as I've said to you guys in a number of these lectures already, I leave it up to you to try to imagine why specifically certain lines will be edited out um, from the reading. Let's go down to uh, recorders ages hence and let's just recognize already what we have said so many times in our earlier studies. Whitman was acutely aware of his future. He wanted desperately to know that he could affect the change both in his own present day, we've said trying to obviously keep you know the great war from happening, we he, he obviously failed at that but he very much believed that his stuff would be read a hundred years later. It would not shock him that we are conducting a study of all the poems of Leaves of Grass and calling it Talks with Walt. It would please him, but it wouldn't shock him because he somehow knew that in ages hence he would in fact be uh, you know, celebrated. Let's just enjoy the poem and then exegete. Recorders ages hence come. I will take you down underneath this impassive exterior. I will tell you what to say of me. Publish my name and hang up my picture as that of the tenderest lover. The friend, the lover's portrait. Of whom his friend, his lover, was fondest. Who was not proud of his songs, but of the measureless ocean of love within him. And freely poured it forth. Who often walked lonesome walks, thinking of his dear friends, his lovers, who Pensive away from what he loved, often lay sleepless and dissatisfied at night. Who knew too well the sick, sick dread, lest the one he loved might secretly be indifferent to him. Whose happiest days were far away through fields and woods, on hills, he and another wandering hand in hand, they twain apart from other men. Who oft as he sauntered the streets, curved with his arm the shoulder of his friend while the arm of his friend rested upon him also. Now we'll begin, of course, as we said, with this feeling of how important it is that we focus on the future. And what is it that he says? Well, he begins with the very first word of leaves of grass, the word come. I told you all the way through leaves of grass, this is one of those really important words I will take you down underneath. Now, of course, if you're following it all, the base of all metaphysics will also be interested underneath Socrates, uh, that is to say, underneath Christ. Here, notice it's underneath this impassive exterior. Now, this is Whitman at his finest, and uh, the great critiquer Helblund loved to point this out, that Whitman is always promising how much biographic information he's going to share with you, the reader, it never seems to happen. Notice he will call it his impassive exterior, as if he doesn't care. I will tell you what to say of me. Now this is ironic, because Whitman was always fighting 
any kind of biographer that really wanted to disclose too much information about him. He says, publish my name and hang up my picture. This is significant given the number of pictures that Whitman took. All you have to do is type in Walt Whitman and then Google image what you'll see. You'll see a lot of photographs, images of Whitman that are quite compelling, especially the ones where he's holding the fake butterfly. I'll let you take a look at it. But what is it that he wants to be most focused on? The tenderest lover. Now, tenderest is a, is, a, is a powerful term, and it gets used a number of times in Lisa Grass, and you'll want to pay attention to it, right? Tenderly will I use you, curly grass from well, uh, Song of Myself, Passage 6, right? The friend, the lover's portrait. So we're back to one of the central themes of Calamus. This idea of the friend. Now, when we see this lover's portrait, we can't help but think of Joyce's portrait of the artist as a young man and the tension regarding what it is that one loves there in that text. We've given lectures on that one at LearnStrong.net. Of whom his friend, his lover, was fondest. In other words, I'm not really that concerned with what you write about me in terms of my abilities as a great writer or a great poet. I'm more interested in what my closest friends have to say about me. And then we have the repetition notice of five who's. Who was not proud of his songs. We have a hard time believing that one given what we've already read, obviously, in Leaves of Grass. But of the measureless ocean now, out, out of the cradle endlessly rocking, we're going to see this metaphor of the ocean over and over again of love within him and freely poured it forth. Of course, the alighted for, 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 for poured it forth. In other words, it is for Whitman most significant that he's known as the great lover, the great friend, the great comrade was the language of the previous poem, who often walked lonesome walks. We'll get to this when we do Song of the Open Road, that classic poem of walking. But how many times have we heard walking? Passage 46 and 47 of Song of Myself, for example. Who often walked lonesome walks thinking of his dear friends, his lovers, Whitman will use the term friends and lovers interchangeably. Now a lot will be made of this poem and the next as it relates to the potentiality of a sexual love versus some kind of platonic love. I'm going to leave that up to you. The scholars themselves are often divided and split about how much Whitman is saying versus hiding, showing versus not revealing, and I'll leave that one up to you. But notice his lovers who pensive, we've seen that, that notion of being pensive as in uncertain, right? Who pensive away from one he loved often lay sleepless and dissatisfied at night. And of course this dissatisfaction and this sleeplessness we have seen a number of times already, of course in the Children of Adam and now in the Calamus section for sure, who knew too well the sick, comma, sick, and then he uses the word dread from our study of Hamlet, of course, Act 3, and the to be or not to be soliloquy, the dread of something after death, right? Lest the one he loved might secretly be indifferent to him. Notice that earlier he said that he wants to create the, the uh, being underneath the impassive exterior, and then he uses the term indifferent. His concern, of course, is that he's very much into someone who is not into him, who might even be indifferent to him. And let's put it as, po as we said, there's five Whitmans, right, that we're focusing on, and one of those is Whitman as person. Whitman had his struggles with people who let him down, people who he thought were, were, would be his friends or lovers, and then it didn't end up working out for him. So he's obviously referencing that. Who's happiest days. Now between this poem and the poem to come next, we'll call these the happy poems, right? He's constantly interested in the use of this word, happy. Whose happiest days were far away through fields, notice we're outside the city, in woods we think of Thoreau, on hills he and another wandering hand in hand, the wandering makes us think of the Odyssey, the hand in hand makes us think of the concluded, concluding lines of, of Milton's Paradise Lost, they twain apart from other men. In other words, being somehow alone, out, separated with my pal, he says, that for me is when I am in fact most happy. Who often, notice the use of the word often being repeated, he sauntered, it's a great word and he loves this word, sauntered the streets, now we're back in the city, curved with his arm the shoulder of his friend while the arm of his friend rested upon him. Also, we think about, I hear America singing and those joyful men who are all singing with their arms around each other's necks. 
Obviously, we as well think about passage 46 and the ways in which the teacher there and the student will rely on each other. You can rest the chuff of your hand. You'll remember the line in passage 46 of Song of Myself. Well, what is going on here at 2A in major messages? Well, obviously, the only thing he cares to be remembered for is the one he loved and who loved him. That's all he says that he wants to care about. Notice he even seems to suggest, I don't really care if people remember me for my songs, namely, of course, this collection of poems that we're reading now, but rather that I was in the lives of other people. Now, there is some dark irony in this request because biographers will repeatedly point out that Whitman seemed to spend so much of his time apart and alone and not with the ones that he wishes that he could love. At 2B, of course, the repetition of who is remarkable here, this who, 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 over and over again. I mentioned in 3A, obviously, Sir Rose Walden comes to mind. Milton's Paradise Lost as well comes to mind. And finally, at 3B, how do you own a poem like this? Well, it begs the question, how do you want to be remembered, right? How do you want others to speak of you? And do you, does it matter at all that the way you're remembered is the people that you love, the people that you cherish the people that you took care of. Now, when we come back to uh, pick up the next poem, when I heard at the close of day, we're going to finish this loop, and we're going to pay attention to the ways in which Whitman's going to talk about what it means to be happy. And, of course, we'll have to go back to a poem late in Song of Myself. Thank you.